So a major transformation for the Chinese economy, wages rising significantly, higher inflation, a growth model which is changing and indeed slowing, and the importance of challenge and challenge of financial reform in this leading economy. I really like that line from economic miracle to normal development in future. Well, I'm sure you've got plenty of questions and we do have plenty of time for questions this morning. If you'd like to ask a question, could you please come to the microphones? We have two microphones in each of the aisles. Uh, if you'd like to say who you are, please, and where you're from, and could I ask you please to actually ask questions as opposed to make statements. So if you'd like to ask questions, please make your way to the microphone and please make it clear who you would like to address that question to. Um, while you're gathering your thoughts and making your way to the microphone, uh, I might ask a couple of quick ones myself. Alan Oster, perhaps firstly to you, because unemployment is very much in the news. We have seen continuing stories about what's happening in the manufacturing sector, of course Qantas in recent days, and there seems to be a nervousness in the community about the rising rate of unemployment. Now you've said rising to about 6.5% but possibly going higher, why might it go higher? And if it does, what are the implications for the economic outlook for the economy, which you've said is reasonably bright? The, the reason that I worry, well, to put a context first, the announcements that have been made in the manufacturing sector, particularly like the car industry, um, they're very spectacular. They're very hard to sort of get a feel over because they're over the next three years sort of story. Also, they're actually, by an Australian or a state level, small. So, you know, if you look at, say, Victoria, um, the car industry, even if they wipe the entire car industry out, including all the sort of flow-on effects, it's about 0.9 of 1%. Mm. So it's about 40,000 jobs in total um, in terms of um, Australia. And in normal circumstances, that's like two months' worth of employment growth. Now, the problem, I think, is rather that you're not going to have a major problem in Australia associated with that because there'll be other things happening, but you will have postcode problems. And I think the one that makes people feel nervous, and this is the, the one that I can't measure, um, is that everybody is going to sit back and think, oh, I might lose my job. Because we, we do anxiety indexes as well, and what we see is a progressive increase in the amount of anxiety about people losing their jobs. Now, they're probably not going to lose their job, but um, they might worry about it, and then you get the paradox of thrift. You, you, don't, you don't spend as much. You, you're consume, your business, you don't invest as much, and you don't hire as much. Um, the, the answer as to why it might go higher is everybody, unless you own an iron ore mine uh, or an LNG platform, is living in a world of 1% growth. And traditional models, um, well, I, I used to find the best relationship between employment growth and anything else was domestic demand. Now, if I do that and I run the domestic economy at 1%, I get a very high number. So what I've sort of done is I've sort of said, well, that can't happen, so I'm going to use GDP because the economy's a bit different this time in the sense that you're going to get more income coming in. But I think reality is if inflation looks OK um, and you're running into an election in 12 to 18 months beyond the end of this year, something will happen. So I, ex I expect the government or the central bank will respond to that. Thank you. Now, question to my right, sir. Uh, Lens Len Stevens, Seafood Cooperative Research Centre. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Huang, please, uh, in relation to the changing economy that you've described in China, how do you think that will influence the Chinese government's willingness to sign a free trade agreement with China, please? With who? With the who? To sign, a sign a free trade agreement between China and Australia. OK. Um, I'm not aware of uh, the um, development of uh, um, on the bilateral um, FTA negotiation with uh, um, Australia, um, but I'm, um, I'm involved um, a lot in a discussion with the U.S. 
on TPP and on a potential um, FTA. And obviously, we, we are negotiating on the BIT, the bilateral in, um, investment treaty. Um, so I can only answer your question broadly, not uh, um, specifically. Um, the Chinese government previously took a position that uh, um, it did not want have anything to do with the TPP. And so obviously, I uh, would not have any association uh, as a, a bilateral um, FTA. But I think the leaders changed their mind um, last uh, year or two. I think after the new leaders came in, into office, they reassessed the situation. And now they became very active um, pursuing the exploring the possibilities of joining TPP. Um, and I think that it would be applicable, um, that the overall attitude will be applicable to, toward um, an FTA with, um, with Australia. The key reason is because China needs all the um, external forces to help with the domestic reforms. Previously, for instance, the reason why the government was reluctant in even talking about the TPP was because, number one, they regard the TPP as a US device to um, isolate China. And the number two, all the reform agenda they were talking about, well, the bars were too high for China. That was the previous assessment. The reason why they changed um, was, uh, number one, they realized, well, maybe Americans have all their reasons why they're doing it. But this could be the new model of globalization. And if that's the case, then China wants to be a part of it, uh, making the, the basic rules. The second reason why China is keen also in joining is because all the reform, difficult reforms previously we feared that we would not be able to, 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 to implement um, are, the, are the reforms we want to do ourselves. Even if we don't negotiate with anybody else, these are the reforms like liberalization of the, of the service sector, protection of intellectual property rights, agricultural trade liberalization, um, and so on. So. Um, I think the mind has changed, and as I said, I don't really know the specifics about China-Australian uh, negotiation, but I think in terms of push ahead with, the, um, uh, with, with moving the economy to the new level of opening, this is the official language, um, I think that would mean very positive uh, sentiment toward an FTA with Australia. Now I can see at least four questions. I'll take one in the centre. Um, Craig Perkins from Regional Development Australia, Tasmania. Um, my question to Alan is, um, I was recently in Melbourne for Chinese New Year um, and they closed two blocks, two, a block of two streets for um, celebrations. One of them was back-to-back -back food tents, the other one was back-to-back off-the-plan um, apartments for sale. So I understand exactly what you're saying when you're talking about the real estate. So my question is, um, do you see that happening um, mainly in the major capitals or extending into <coughs> more um, regional Australia, and particularly now, I guess, from Yiping's uh, presentation around um, slowing the growth down, what impact they might, they might have on that um, investment property as well? Um, we, have that, we have that sort of data by state. Um, Melbourne has always been the focus of the Chinese investment, but recently it's Sydney, and the other one we're seeing a renewed interest is Brisbane. Um, which is uh, in the Gold Coast area. I haven't seen anything in relation to Tasmania and, and the other areas, to be honest. Um, but at this stage, I think there is this dynamic that they're looking, and we, we see a lot of examples where you don't have to go to Foreign Investment Review Board if it's new, basically. And so what we find is we find developers who will buy a block of land and build 100 <coughs> units on it and market it purely in China. Now, it's not just an Australian thing. I was in Canada recently in Ottawa um, and Toronto, and they have massive expansions, and it's also apartments there as well. So it's the sort of area where um, you're looking for a bolt hole, you're looking for investment, um, and how they get the money out, I don't know. Um, but they're not supposed to, but they do. And, the, and I think it's mainly going to be capital cities and higher quality stuff. Question up the back. Uh, Ian Baker, NT Farmers. Just uh, to Dr Huang, just to, if you could brief us a little bit about drivers of export of uh, investment outside of China. Is this, what are the drivers? Is this gonna keep going? 
Are there policy settings that are encouraging this? Export sector. Um, I'm not sure um, this will continue to be a government, government policy to support export. Obviously, um, we have been a major exporter of labor-intensive manufacturing goods, uh, but that sector is uh, um, now suf suffering from uh, a major setback because of the rapidly rising uh, wage cost. In fact, I just came back from my, my hometown, and one of my neighbors was, was, was a tie maker, um, and he used to be uh, doing a very good business, but now he's having major difficulties. And the, the way he explained was quite uh, uh, simple, because the um, pro output price hasn't changed for the past 10 years, but the uh, labor cost, uh, um, um, I think, is quadrupled from 1,000 yuan per month to now 4,000 yuan per, per month. So that is having major difficulties now. I think this whole sector um, needed to upgrade and change. So, so I don't know if um, the government would, uh, would, would introduce new measures to stimulate exports, partly because now China is already a large exporter. But we are seeing lots of efforts in promoting or encouraging Chinese companies going overseas. Um, China is already the second largest ex uh, investor in terms of outward direct investment. And just to add one number to the discussion we just had earlier, um, the government is thinking about liberalizing the capital account, which means we are going to see more capital outflows. Um, there was recently there was a study by um, IMF um, economists. They actually discovered that just looking at uh, uh, capital account liberalization in the next few years, the net capital outflow could potentially be um, equivalent to between 4 to 8 percent of GDP. So we're going to see massive capital outflows in the next few years. Now, time is short. I'll take the three more questions that I know of, uh, starting in the middle. Uh, Graham Peart, Agricultural Consultant. Uh, two questions possibly to Karen. The comment about reducing the burdens uh, of government regulation, New Zealand appears to give a wonderful example of how to do it and how to keep it low. We've let it completely run away. From New Zealand, where are the examples of how we could cut back to their level? The second one is R&D. We've seen the R&D infrastructure run down till it's old, understaffed and decrepit. Uh, it's a very low base from, to restart from. Where do you see the federal government picking that up? I'll have to plead complete ignorance of the New Zealand deregulation experience, I'm afraid. It's, uh, ABES is doing quite a lot of work on deregulation at the moment and it's certainly something that we will want to look at we're doing an assessment of the, um, the stock of regulation at the moment uh, in the agriculture sector, and we'll be moving on to, to look at the costs of regulation and the potential benefits from deregulation. So New Zealand might well be a, a good example to take into account. Um, in terms of R&D, um, I think we know that we have a, a sound um, R&D corporation sector in Australia, and the um, uh, that approach, I think, has, has been well-founded and uh, probably will continue to, to develop in the context of, of the government's recent, recent announcements. Thank you, Karen. Uh, last question over there in a minute, but a gentleman over here who's been very patient. Sir, come to the microphone. I am Professor Jalal Arif, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan. I'm the member of delegation from PAC, Pakistan Agriculture Coalition. I'm asking the question from Mr. Hong. He has very comprehensively mentioned the growth parameter economy of China. I have a question in my mind that the stakeholder or the end user are very important parameter of the research how the open market system and the institutional factor are playing the role for addressing the issues of stakeholder, 
are playing their role in the growth and economy of a country. Professor. I'm not sure if I understand the question accurately. Um, stakeholder, what do you mean? Stakeholder, the people working for the growth of the agriculture and the marketing and the growing of the produce and facing problem in marketing. In the agriculture sector you're in talking agriculture about. Sector. Okay. Um, well, um, the, the package itself um, didn't focus a lot on agriculture sector itself. Um, I think there are two things that would affect the agricultural production in the coming years. Number one is there was a major component on the land reform. Um, the land reform, the idea is uh, um, just to, 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 to strengthen the key, um, two key functions of land. Number one, as an asset of farmers, and number two, as um, input of production, agricultural production. So in order to uh, make sure these two functions uh, um, work properly, you need two things. Number one is property rights. Um, and you need just made it very clear this is a farmer's property rights. And the number two, in order for um, the production factor to work properly, you need a market to determine the price. So I think there are lots of complications in the discussion and in the land reform. Obviously, land reform is a very messy process. But I think the broader direction is just to make sure um, property right is gradually more clearly defined over time. And the number two, uh, price of land is determined through market mechanisms. Maybe not the free market, but the market mechanism has to play a, a critical role. That would mean a lot of room for um, skill efficiency in agriculture, because at the moment, this is a collective farm. Uh, although it's a household responsibility system, but everybody has a small piece of land, and the scale efficiency is very difficult to achieve. The second element that is also related to agricultural production is the household registration system, which means uh, migrant workers settling in the urban areas will be able to obtain the urban residency, which means they will be able to, they, they, they will be entitled to all the same kind of social welfare benefit in the cities. And that will be the beginning that uh, land concentration can happen because they will remain, they will become true urban residents. While at the moment, many of the migrant workers in the cities, they're more like a guest workers and they still return home. Um, the household, household registration system will change. So so I think overall, um, the, 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 the trend, what I should, would expect is the number of farmers will be substantially reduced, and that is probably the way to increase uh, per capita income in the agriculture. Final question. David Walker, National Land Care Network. My question is to Karen Schneider. Uh, Karen, I'm referring to the declining rate of productivity growth in Australian <coughs> agriculture. I was wondering to what extent is that slowing Rate related to a slowdown in the uptake by farmers of sustainable practices, and to what extent is it related to a slowdown in the rate of repair of the resources that uh, took place through the 1990s because of the investment in, in uh, resource uh, improvement? A lot, of the, a lot of the slowdown that we actually see in that last 10 years or so is to do um, actually with seasonal conditions, the, with drought years, um, and there are many other factors uh, that lie behind it. I actually would suggest that um, that question can be best answered in the productivity session this afternoon where we'll be exploring productivity trends in a lot more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for your questions. Uh, this session is now out of time, but uh, pleasantly surprised. I'm not sure what you were expecting, but I think the, uh, the outlook that we've received here this morning in this session has been somewhat more buoyant than I was anticipating, and let's hope that our experts are right. Could you please thank our panel this morning, Karen Schneider, Yiping Huang and Alan Oster.